Well, good morning. Um, my name is Lori Anderson. I am the manager of the Mechanical Circulatory Support Program at Tampa General Hospital. We are very appreciative of this invitation to be able to get in front of you and tell you a little bit about uh, the bad patient population as well as our program at TGH. There are multiple patients that are out and about in the community um, enjoying life, going to restaurants, at, even out at the beach. And so uh, if when you do have a call for one of these patients, it's important that you know a little bit about the device and what to do for the urgent or emergent situation. And so that's why I'm here today. So the program at TGH is about 25 years old. Um, currently we are managing about 100 outpatients. I think in Sarasota, Manatee County, there's about eight patients. The other sort of distinct group of patients that we have traveling down here in this area are all our so-called snow vads. And these are patients that may be uh, associated with another program, but they are traveling down in this area. You guys are obviously a popular spot. Uh, so we have many patients that are down here for a weekend, a week, or even the season. As patients move around uh, the country as VAD coordinators, we do sort of make sure that they have the contact information of the closest VAD center. So many are coming down here knowing where the closest center is should they have a need. Uh, but after today's presentation, I hope you'll know a little bit about us and how to get in touch with us uh, for that patient, whether we're managing them or not. So before we talk about VADs or ventricular assist devices, I think it's important to talk about the patient population for which this type of therapy is intended, being those patients with a diagnosis of heart failure. Now we know there's more than probably five, uh, current estimates put it at about 5 million people in this country each year with a diagnosis of heart failure. Um, it can be caused by multiple things, every, everything from ischemic heart disease, coronary artery disease, postpartum, viral, even the idiopathic patient population, just meaning for whatever reason, the end result is the heart has become weaker and less effective or efficient at pumping blood around and around. We do know we can't necessarily cure heart failure. We do know that with appropriate interventions targeted at certain intervals, we can slow uh, the progression um, of the condition and hopefully reduce side effects, re reduce the complications, reduce the rehospitalizations for them. Now, I, I know that's a really busy little staircase there, but it is intended to just show you the stepwise fashion that we manage heart failure. Um, at the bottom of the rung is kind of those conservative treatment options like reducing risk factors, putting patients on fluid uh, restrictions, dietary uh, instruction. And you can see as we move up here, medication therapy is added. Um, perhaps interventional procedures like PCI, um, certainly ICDs, pacemakers are employed. But I want, what I wanna draw your attention to is the top part or sort of that blue area. And these are considered the options of end resort. As I said a few minutes ago, we know that heart failure is a progressive disorder for which the condition will get worse. Um, and as it gets worse to what we consider end-stage heart failure, the treatment options that are now available include um, palliative care or hospice. This is a end-stage disease with high degree of mortality and morbidity associated with it. So it's important that we bring in the palliative care and the hospice teams to uh, spend some time with the patient and their family. Secondly, use of long-term ionotropes. There, I don't know if you guys have ever taken care of anyone, but who has uh, an IV drug going, like dibutamine or Primacor, but that IV drug by its action improves the squeeze of the heart. 
Um, it, it involves like a long-term IV access, but with that patients initially report feeling good, feeling very good. Um, some of their congestion is relieved, they right, were able to get fluid off of them. But just like these other treatment options um, that may have been effective initially, over time, less and less effective. Now, cardiac transplant is considered the gold standard for end-stage heart failure. It offers the best in terms of outcome. 50% um, uh, survival post-transplant is at 88% these days. So, fantastic um, uh, survival associated with an end-stage diagnosis. But as we all know, there just are not enough hearts to go around for everybody in this country that would benefit for one, benefit with one. Now, VADS or ventricular assist devices, heart pumps, sort of have been developed over the years in an attempt to fill that gap. Um, offering for patients not just um, quantity of life or more life, but offer also offering quality to life. And certainly over the years, the device therapy, there's been a lot of sort of R&D in this space. And with that, the devices are smaller, they're more durable, they last longer, better batteries, but still um, it's not a perfect uh, option either. So as, as a uh, heart failure coordinator for many years, when I go in to talk to patients about some of these options, we do need to, you know, be very frank and upfront with them that these are options of end resort, meaning all these other treatment options have been exhausted. There's no medication, there's no therapy, there's no surgical procedure. All of that has been exhausted. And now the options that we're talking about all have their own set of risk and benefit. And quite frankly, it's up to the team as well as the patient and their family, which option would be best for them. So for uh, purposes of this discussion, we're gonna talk more about the option of VAD or left ventricular assist device. Now, a LVAD is a mechanical pump that's surgically implanted to assist the failing heart. There are several different types that are out on the market, just like Apple versus Android, that kind of thing, but all of them have the same common features right now. So you'll notice in this diagram, there, uh, when, when the physicians um, implant these things, typically it's through a, a uh, incision in the breastbone, and then when they open the chest, the inflow tube is actually cored into the bottom part of the left side of the heart. Um, from here, the pump sits right here attached to the heart. I'm going to show you this in a minute. So that that tube that uh, is into the heart, it's called the inflow cannula attached to the pump. And then there's an outflow tube that is a sort of wrapped around and is placed in the aorta or that big blood vessel that comes off the left side of the heart. From here, you'll notice tunneling through the chest wall and the abdomen is a drive line. This carries sort of the electronics that communicate the pump to the outside. This will exit on the patient's abdominal wall, so you won't see any of this. They'll close the chest, right? From here, these devices are attached to an outside controller, the microprocessor, the brains of the system. The controller is what stores the settings of the pump, monitors the pump, and if there is an alarm state, it gives a signal on that little LED screen that tells the patient, the caregiver, you, what's wrong and what to do about it. From here, obviously these devices have to run 24 seven, so they're powered by power packs or batteries. So you can see in this diagram, there's two that uh, the mannequin is wearing on a holster. So the two, in that particular device, the two batteries run simultaneously, uh, delivering about 12 to 15 hours of battery power. Patients do have a home unit where they recharge the batteries. Um, they can also power them on the um, 
the cigarette lighter. I know it's not called that anymore, but uh, they also have a mobile adapter should they uh, want to use that. So pump, outflow, drive line, controller, and then the two power packs. I did, I, I think, uh, give you a card that's kind of a pocket card or a reference card for you. And if you look on the back, I did um, give a little bit of information about the four different types of VADs that are used currently at, at Tampa General Hospital. When and any of you have ever um, uh, taken care of a VAD before or, or had, uh, you know, been part of a presentation like this in years past, the first generation VADs that uh, were developed back in like the late 80s, the 90s were uh, uh, big pieces of equipment that were um, uh, titanium encased with a blood sack inside of it that was about two liters. And what would happen, I mean, the, the uh, original ones would be about that big. I mean, they were like, uh, like a whopper. Um, and with that, those devices were pulsatile. And what I mean by pulsatile is the way they worked, they would try to mimic how your heart works. So your heart, what, it fills with blood and it's filled to a certain volume, what happens? It squeezes and pumps blood forward, right? So that's the same thing this first generation of VADs tried to do is act just like your heart. The problem with those devices was, and they were all used for individuals who were waiting on a transplant because they didn't last very long. There were a lot of moving parts they weren't very durable. We would get about a year's worth out of them. And then the device would fail, and it usually failed pretty dramatically with the bearings within it, clunking and chugging and spewing. And then what would happen is we would have to hand pump those pumps until we either made a decision about to with, you know, withdraw care, to um, transplant the patient, or to uh, take them back to the OR and put another pump in. The reason I want to make that point to you is that wasn't very desirable to have all of this for about a year's worth of a VAD. So the second and third generation pumps are what we call non-pulsatile, meaning there's only one moving part in them and blood is continuously flowing through them um, to um, assist the needs of the body. So with this, and I, I only uh, took this device and hooked it up to a water um, loop just to demonstrate that for you. So when you um, check a pulse on a patient or, um, or uh, take a blood pressure, you know, you feel that, that pulsation, right? You, and when you listen over them, you hear that kind of boom, 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 boom. With this particular device, this is called a HeartMate 2, and there is uh, a little diagram uh, of it on your table. Um, with this device, if I did the cutaway, and I'll show you a picture of it, this is the pump right here, and then I just attached the water loop that simulates your circulatory system. So if you did a cutaway of this um, device, inside is an impeller that's spinning uh, right now, about 9,400 times a minute. So it is continuously pulling blood around and around. So with that um, um, particular design, now the, you're not made to, to sort of uh, work with continuous flow. So there are some problems that, that can occur because of continuous blood flow as opposed to non pulse uh, as, sorry as opposed to pulsatile so when the vat is implanted it it continues to do the majority of the work so a patient who is implanted with one of these devices has a big sick heart right but it is still pumping uh, maybe 1 to 2 liters of blood flow per minute with the VAD, the VAD can assist by delivering an additional four, five, six liters of blood per minute. 
the native heart still working, contribu contributing to the total blood flow. It's just the majority of the work is accomplished because of the action of the VAD. And if the VAD is flowing at a continuous pace, doing the majority of the work, um, patients will not have a pulse. They will not have a pulse. You'll not be able to feel one anywhere. Make sense? So it is a little, it takes a little bit of time to get used to, certainly when you assess a patient and that, like, how are you gonna assess a patient? You know, it, it sort of takes you back to your uh, just good old fashioned skills of physical exam because you're not going to have the ability to check a pulse and a blood pressure on a standard cuff is considered inaccurate. You can take it, it may even display a number for you, but it is not considered accurate. Um, we are able to check a blood pressure and we are able to examine them and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So these are the VADs that are used at TGH. Uh, you see the HeartMate 2 is the one I just showed you. Oh, sorry, wrong end. Down here, this one was originally developed uh, some 20 years ago, most studied VAD out there. Um, over time, yeah. it uh, sort of the next generation is the HeartMate 3, and currently this is the most common VAD that's used in the U.S. Um, it offers the best in terms of long-term durability, outcome, and fewer complications associated with it. Um, this device in the middle is just another LVAD hardware, and I still sort of bring it around and show it just because we have about 15 patients still on support, but we are no longer using that one either. Um, in lieu of HeartMate 3, which, which is just, um, a much better device. And then we're, we are involved in a clinical trial right now with a heart with a device called Eva Heart, um, which works just a little bit differently in that there's uh, not the long uh, inflow tube that's sewn into the bottom part of the left side of the heart. It's just poured directly to the heart and it sits flush with it. Also with that device, there is uh, some, uh, settings that you can do to encourage the aortic valve to open up so that the patient <clears throat> will have some pulsatility from their native heart. So sort of Eva Heart's claim to fame is that uh, patients would have fewer complications. Um, uh, that remains to be seen. We've implanted uh, four of those patients. So uh, as I said, first of all, you know, I want you to think of, first of all, in managing these patients and caring for them, to think of VADs as generic. So should you come upon a patient with a VAD, um, what are you going to do? You're going to talk to them, um, you know, assess their level of, of consciousness, their mentation, skin warm and dry, their color, their turgor, whether uh, they look uh, cool or wet or shocky, um, you are able to take what's, what is a mean arterial pressure if the equipment is available. Now I know on your trucks you don't always have these, but our patients do take, we do issue them blood pressure cuffs, the old fashioned kind with a sphygmomanometer and uh, a Doppler. So that when you take a manual mean arterial pressure, the, compass, the cuff is placed over the arm, pumped up, and then listen over the pulse uh, point or the pressure point with the Doppler. As you let the cuff down, the first sound heard in a pulseless patient is considered to be the mean arterial pressure. Um, as I said, many of our patients are issued these, so they many of them carry them in their bag. So in case they do have one available, uh, that would be something that uh, you could ask, either do yourself or ask the caregiver to get you a, a map. 
Um, also, if you are to look on the controller of these devices, it does give you some numbers. And it, it uh, when interrogated, and I'll let you do a little bit of hands-on in a minute, but with this particular one on the screen, you're able to pull up the number and pull up the flow, which flow in a vatted patient means a calculated number of liters per minute of how much flow the device is delivering. That number should be greater than four. The map in these patients, just like you, the normal map is 70 to 90. If they have a low map, we're gonna treat them like hypotension, right? It's still low blood pressure. Um, as opposed to patients that have a high map, we treat that the same, like we would any other patient with antihypertensive medications. Um, so um, a little bit of frame of reference on this. I worked with a, um, a 911 call a couple of years ago and it was a patient that was uh, visiting here from the Northeast, unbeknownst to um, any of the VAD programs. And while sitting there in the food court, his wife uh, left him to go do a little shopping. While he was sitting there, bystanders noticed that he looked like he was very slumped over. And then all of a sudden he just kind of passed out and fell onto the top of the table. So they went over to help him and, um, you know, realized he was really cold and clammy and they couldn't arouse him. 911 was called, EMS arrived. Uh, they noted that the patient was kind you know, they, they uh, noted that they kind of put him down and realized he was breathing. He was cool and clammy. He did not have a pulse. He was all alone. He did not have a a VAD back with him that I will show you in a few minutes. And um, they went ahead and uh, put an airway on him and started compressions. Oh, one, one other detail. They did notice the VAD. They did notice all the equipment. They thought it was a very sophisticated feeding tube because remember the, the drive line exits on the abdominal wall. So they thought it was a feeding tube. Um, what would you have done? He's breathing. Before or after this class? <laughs> <laughs> Good response. Sure. Yeah. So with this, with this young man, he was hypoglycemic. Um, so his wife comes out of the, the shopping, you know, the store that she was in you know, surveys the situation, runs over there and starts telling them, no, he has an LVAD, you know, he has an LVAD, I'm sure it's his sugar. Um, there are a whole lot of questions there for you, but at any rate, we got called because um, we, uh, they had our number as a, as a closest VAD program. And so we were able to sort of um, help them stabilize him and uh, they you know, corrected his blood sugar and he came to our facility. Mm -hmm. There was some issues with the drive line and how that was handled. And so uh, we did uh, locate his implanting center. We fixed uh, the drive line and then sent him back. So, um, but uh, two, that is, you know, I told you at the onset, I was so appreciative of opportunities like that because I'm hoping after today, you're gonna recognize this equipment and at least ask a few more questions about, about this type of patient as you're doing your assessment. So that's just uh, the sort of process of doing the map, you know, putting the cuff on, listening with the Doppler over the pressure point, and then when you let it out, first sound heard is the map.
So just to go in a little bit on the, the particulars of these devices, HeartMate 2 and HeartMate 3, um, you know, second and third generation from, uh, from sort of the HeartMate family of these LVADs. They do use the same um, platform in terms of the external equipment. So this particular device that I showed you at the onset, this is a HeartMate 2. And then uh, the HeartMate 3 is uh, here. And that's act these are actual pumps. Uh, drive line and then plugs into the controller. I'm not gonna plug it in just because it alarm, I, this one alarms all the time and we can't stop it, so. Um, you notice same controllers, they work the same. The only difference is a HeartMate 3 controller is black and a HeartMate 2 controller is white, um, but that's really more for, uh, for us. The batteries are the same, the clips are the same. Up in the upper right hand corner over there, that number five, that's the battery charger that the patients are, are and we use them in the hospital as well uh, to recharge their batteries. And then number six, that's uh, their power unit so that when at home they hook up to electricity. So we teach our patients to, when they go to bed at night, to plug into AC operation. And once their feet hit the ground in the morning, you hope they're up on battery packs. Lori, would you mind um, showing us again the HeartMate 3, the, the anatomy of it, and where it goes on the heart and the tubes and so forth? Sure. Go? So, so cord in to the left side of the heart, bottom of the left ventricle, um, is the pump, and then the pump attaches directly to the left ventricular apex. Um, the outflow tube that comes off of it, then attaches via a graft to the aorta or that big blood vessel that comes off the left side of the heart. So that with this arrangement, just like any of these other devices, blood would flow back to the right side of the heart as normal. It would go to um, the lungs and when it comes back into the left side of the heart, it's kind of a straight shot into the inflow tube, into the pump, and then out the outflow tube. Blood still going through the native heart, right? It's just the majority of blood flow is gonna pass through via the action of the VAD. Thanks. Sure. And then the controller, the microprocessor right here, uh, what I want you to see on here is that, you know, the screen when it's just a normal operating mode, there is a green light right here that's on. And so right now everything is good. The, the screen isn't lit up. It's just the green light that tells you everything's on and good. If you wanted to look at the flow, this display button or the little screen is what you depress and then it will show you the numbers. For your purposes, what I think you're only interested in is what the flow is. If you scroll through this, this will give you some other numbers with respect to power consumption, um, the activity of what the native left heart is doing, etc. cetera. Um, you cannot change any of these settings um you you can't uh, do anything to this wrong it's just a monitoring device for you at the hospital and when patients come in to see us in clinic what we do is attach them to a computer and interrogate the device and then we can scroll through and get all kinds of identifiers in terms of uh, alarms uh, what they may have did with their power uh, we can say, hey, what happened at 6 a.m. on May 1st? And they're like, how do you know that? It's like, I, you know, you can scroll through and, and get all of that. So we do that for, for uh, normal function. Patients can't change any of the settings. You have to have that interrogator to be able to do it. Uh, the other thing to note on uh, the status symbols is right here there's a battery button that shows you how much power 
Um, and so uh, patients will look at that to know how much more time they have. Also on the batteries themselves, there is a fuel gauge that just sort of counts down. With HeartMate 2 and HeartMate 3, remember both batteries drain equally. So when they go to change, when they need to change batteries, they need to change them one at a time. Uh, this equipment is also unique in that it has an internal battery. So if the patient should completely deplete their batteries, there is an internal battery located inside the controller that would continue to power the system for about another 30-ish minutes. Uh, we teach patients not to use that because it is very difficult to recharge that battery. Um, it's done with the interrogator back at the hospital. So we never want anybody to depend on that. However, we see that that happens sometimes. Um, if there is an alarm, um, it would display automatically in this screen um, and it would tell you what's wrong and what you need to do about it. Um, it will give an alarm when there's less than 15 minutes of power left. Um, it, will, um, be, it will go off every two minutes. Once there's left, less than five minutes, it will alarm every two minutes. So there's a, a lot of uh, safety features built into this. Um, and I'm gonna scroll through these because I had already talked about them. Hardware, uh, uh, not a device that we're necessarily using anymore. This looks uh, very similar to a HeartMate 3, and as this one developed, it sort of came up in tandem the same time HeartMate 3 did. Centrifugal flow, uh, the inflow cannula directly implanted. It's a little bit smaller device, but this inflow cannula is directly cored into the apex of the left ventricle, and then uh, the pump, um, is hydrostatic. HeartMate 3 is um, magnetic. So they feel like for s with some of those features, that's what makes HeartMate 3 a better pump. Um, with this then, there's a drive line that is attached to a controller. Here again, it displays numbers for you. Um, very similar um, with uh, a battery charger. With this particular system, the batteries drain one at a time. So uh, whenever patients go to, train, uh, to change the batteries, they change one battery at a time and then it automatically goes on the second battery. They also have a car adapter. They also have a wall adapter to sleep on electricity. The batteries in that system last about four hours. And then that's just the screen of what the hardware controller looks like. Eva Heart, our investigational device is, uh, we, as I said, we've done four patients. Um, it's a little more uh, uh, cumbersome system. It, was, it has been quite difficult to teach the patient just because there's a lot of equipment to it. But um, they actually, when they go home, attach to an external monitor and, um, and a power box is what they call it, uh, just for electric operation. There has been an incidence of uh, thrombus, embolic events associated with that device. So um, we will see what, uh, what the results of the trial will be. Lori, versus uh, the other monitors, what is the, what is the incident rate for? Uh, so I so it's still in trial. I uh, I only know the TGH experience has been high. And then with the other uh, monitors, you're not seeing that. No, but I'm gonna. That's what I want to talk about now. So great segue. Uh, whatever the device is, you know, these patients can have complications like just like anybody else. They're still going to get, um, you know, um, uh, broken hips, broken legs. Uh, they're still going to have cataracts that need to re be removed. But the complications I want to talk about now are specifically with respect to the VAD. 
and you see these in all VADs and as new VADs sort of come on the market, they sort of tout their place or their advantage by how they affect this uh, risk or, and adverse event profile. The first one I'm gonna talk about is infection. Um, really considered the Achilles heel of this kind of therapy. And the infection that I'm referring to is where the device exits the body on the abdominal wall. It's a very fragile spot um, that, you know, once infections occur there, they can like track the length of the drive line even back to the pump pocket and the endocardium. Number two that I wanna talk about is the incidence of thromboembolism. Um, these are foreign pieces of equipment and the body's natural inclination is to clump, is to clot. So all of these patients would be chronically anticoagulated. So it's all about striking a balance. So we're trying to keep them thinned out, so to speak, so that they don't clot, but then it can easily go the other way where they're thinned out and may have bleeding episodes, particularly in the GI system. And then lastly, mechanical failure. These are small electronic pieces of equipment subject to wear and tear and breakdown. That's why it's important that everything outside of the exit site patient has extra equipment for and knows how to disassemble the equipment all the way from the exit side out so that they, we know they can put it back together. Before patients are discharged to home after their surgery, we assure that they can do just that. So first thing to talk about is the exit site. So um, this is a, uh, a, a great looking patient that's got uh, the exit side coming off, um, you know, on his right side. He keeps it clean, dry, and infection-free by doing a daily sterile dressing. He keeps it covered, and then you'll notice just below it, there's a, um, a holder um, adhered to his abdomen that keeps that drive line um, stabilized so that there's not an opportunity for a yank or a pull. Um, I have had these devices, everything from stuck in car doors, uh, pull them on a doorknob, like those kinds of doorknobs. It takes a yank and pull. The controller falls out of the bed. The site takes a yank or a pull, and it can quickly deteriorate to one of these. So uh, here to the, to the right, that's a great looking exit site. You see that drive line where it comes out. The entire circumference around it is adhered. There is a woven Dacron graft uh, on the inside. So right where it exits, uh, that graft promotes like tissue and growth, which is what you want. Um, so that it, it grows in, it adheres, but it takes a yank, it takes a pull, and then that's an open portal for infection. So it can quickly uh, open, flare, become infected. Here in Florida, you know, uh, but people, it's hot, people sweat, and then if they perspire, that can, can sort of continue. A lot of the infections we see are pseudomonas because of the water, um, you know, stat, I mean, we see, we see everything, but as I said, there's a high degree of mortality and morbidity. And once these infections start, they're virtually, um, uh, you, you virtually cannot cure them. So for us, we um, preach um, uh, good daily dressing changes, keeping it mounted, keeping it on a, on a holder so that there's no way it can yank, it can pull. Um, all of our patients wear some kind of a device to hold the equipment, whether it's holsters, fishing vests, um, I have a lady that carries a Gucci bag with all of her stuff in the back. We don't really care what it is. It just needs to be something to make sure your equipment is stowed away pro properly and there's not a chance for it to fall out and, and uh, uh, provide a yank because it, they're very difficult to treat. Um, uh, as I said, uh, complications, we see a fair amount of uh, thromboembolism. 
Um, we do see a lot of strokes. And so as a VAD coordinator, if you tell me you have a headache, I'm going to tell you to go to the ER and get a CAT scan of your brain. Because that means, that means stroke to me straight up. And uh, unfortunately, um, we're usually right. It was done on post-mortem of a patient that had been recently discharged and he was taking uh, uh, warfarin and aspirin for anticoagulation. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with Lovenox, um, but Lovenox is an injectable blood thinner and uh, we do serial uh, INR testing. We do point of care, uh, finger stick INRs. And so he had uh, called in his INR and it was subtherapeutic. So he was asked to increase his dose of warfarin and uh, use your Lovenox for twice a day for two doses, I think it was. At any rate, he was not comfortable to give himself the shot. He'd been in the hospital for a long time and had really sort of decided uh, they won't know the difference. I'm gonna increase my warfarin like they told me and I'll be fine. He presented to the hospital uh, uh, cold, clammy, short of breath, uh, very lethargic. He couldn't stand up. He could barely sit up. Um, he was in cardiogenic shock. Why? His VAD wasn't working. His VAD had completely ingested thrombus. And so all he had was his native heart. And his native heart was big, weak, and not able to adequately support the needs of his body. Unfortunately, this patient did not survive. Pretty dramatic, um, you know, being full of clot in that way, but what we see more often, uh, that, uh, that patient's uh, VAD was the one on the far right. If you look at the other two, um, this is the impeller inside the HeartMate 2, and you can see how there's just clot that's kind of wrapped itself around, um, you know, around the veins of that impeller. And then on the inflow, um, on the inflow conduit, uh, there is a point there with a ruby head, and that's what's adhered to it as a big thrombus. For both of these patients, they uh, and it presented with um, uh, hemolysis symptoms, they reported that they had coat-colored urine. Um, and so, uh, again, t telltale sign to us of hemolysis, so we brought those patients right in um, for, for um, further care. What would, what would we expect to see on the alarm from a, in a, in a, in a clotted patient? Low flow. Low, 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 low flow. Low flow. So you, and uh, if you had a, a blood pressure cuff or a MAP, they would be hypotensive. But you can see in the example on the right, there was no flow going through that at all. Now, the flow in these devices is calculated. It's a, um, a based on speed um, and resistance is how it's calculated. So. That patient was still um, showing a flow of like 2.9. Mm -hmm. And in the pre-hospital setting, what would you recommend for us to do? Um, call your VAG coordinator. They need to be transported. Um, it would be conservative care, symptom management, probably some fluids, oxygen fluids, that kind of thing. Um, so, as I said, INR, they're fully anticoagulated. Do you guys do finger sticks on the trucks? No. No. Are they all in warfarin or are they on another anticoagulant? Warfarin's the drug of choice uh, because it's reversible. We uh, do do platelet testing on many of these people. We do, we have a few that are warfarin resistant. Um, that's something new that we've started testing and then identifying. Um, but we have done some platelet testing and put uh, sort of uh, have a few patients on Prolenta. Have not done Eliquis. Uh, there are other programs that are, are um, investigating that, but we have not gone there yet. 
So, as I said, it's all about balance, just, you know, uh, the other way, bleeding. So, most commonly, as I said, the, that sort of combination of continuous blood flow, um, you know, um, uh, we were not created to sort of work with a continuous blood flow. Our systems work better with pulsatility. So, that seems to affect the gut uh, the most. So. They will have areas of uh, uh, little malformations that can occur. And then that combination of having them fully anticoagulated sets them up. So again, you know, one of our teaching points is, you know, patients uh, monitoring themselves, monitoring their stools, and if they change in color consistency to let us know. Um, patients can, uh, you know, certainly bleed, even by the time they come in, dropping their hemoglobins, you know, more than half of what it was. The other sort of um, um, bleeding complication we see so much in these patients is um, uh, nosebleeds. Again, something about the anatomy and the nasal cavity that, uh, you know, is aggravated with continuous flow. There was a patient that we actually had uh, living in Longboat Key that uh, would develop these horrifying nosebleeds where he just essentially hemorrhaged. Um, uh, I remember one time they had a, a party at his house. He had a lot of company and apparently it was all white carpeting and furniture in this home. And he started to bleed and they couldn't stop it with all the conservative measures you know, pressure, uh, et cetera, nasal sprays. Um, ended up being transported back to TGH by the time we got him, which was about two hours after the onset, his hemoglobin was three. I mean, so when I say it's just not an annoying not nosebleed, they can really have some um, uh, bad ones. E ENT went back up in there. He had developed one of those uh, AV malformations and uh, they were able to cauterize it. After that, we had tried a couple of times to be able to put him back on warfarin and he did not tolerate it. Not a, not a, a nosebleed as bad as the initial one, but he would have them. So we ended up for the rest of his life, we ran him without anticoagulation. So sometimes, you know, it's a whole risk benefit decision and, and we have had a handful of patients over the years that the decision was made to let them run off anticoagulation and if, if they were to uh, thrombose their pump, you know, we would bring them in for supportive care um, and withdrawal. Surprisingly enough, uh, that, that patient survived another five years off anticoagulation, which goes against everything we believe about devices, but some people, uh, it is the right thing to do. Yes. Question, is the device um, sophisticated enough to give an indication whether there's an issue with the pump or whether it's a volume depleted patient? No. Doesn't tell us that? No. So in the field, really, it's, it's more just a history of what's Correct. Going on. And sort of putting all of it together, there is not one indicator in managing these patients that sort of says, you know, that's it. This well, is what we're going to do. It would cause a low flow alarm, though, right? If right. If they were volume depleted? Correct, okay. and it would, uh, these devices do alarm when the flow is less than four, so that's why we use that as our indicator. So uh, we talked a little bit about mechanical failure and, and sort of how to work through that. We um, uh, do um, have our patients carry what we call a bad bag, which, is uh, right here. So um, this is like TGH issued. So obviously you see it looks like a camera bag. Um, it has been taken before. I, I think maybe people thinking that that's why we started putting the patches on that say, you know, emergency metal, medical equipment just to maybe dissuade them. Uh, but inside, patients carry their extra batteries, an extra controller, a med list, um, a syringe of Lovenox. 
uh, so that if they're out and about and their battery alarm goes off, they can quickly change and replenish with two fresh batteries. Um, the controller would be only for emergency situations. We do teach patients how to change their controller, but we do not advise them to do that alone. They need to be with somebody, because you can imagine when you take a controller off, the device stops. And so if they can't make those connections to reestablish the controller, um, the device stays off. Um, with this uh, two, uh oh, sorry, then we've got some other little uh, goodies in here. Um, just emergency, we have a packing list that they carry. Um, it's got our phone number on it. On the front of your card, there is a, um, a couple of contact numbers. The that pager is um, is what you guys need to use to get in, in touch with the VAD team at TGH. One of the VAD coordinators is carrying that 24 seven. Even if it's not our patient, we will help you through the urgent or the emergent situation and then help to identify where that patient's from and get in touch with their coordinators. Um, we do have our patients, you can see, I, I didn't bring any, but those little emergencies, those are our medic alert bracelets, and they're that sort of silicone band. Um, and uh, that coordinators are organized across the country, actually internationally, and a couple of years ago, we created what's referred to as field service guides. These are color-coded, quick reference guides uh, to help you troubleshoot a VAD. And you can see in the, in the diagram there, there is a green bordered cheat sheet, and that's for HeartMate 3. So how would you know to pull that up? Well, the patient has a green bracelet on, but on their VAD bag, um, we have a green tag with a QR code. So if you, um, you know, scan this, that will come up and it'll it's not intended to replace um, you know getting advice from the VAD coordinator but that kind of helps so that if you have an alarm state on a device and you're like I, I, it says low flow it says call the hospital contact um, what am I supposed to do um, that kind of helps you have a visual mm -hmm. while you're perhaps FaceTiming the on-call VAD coordinator so that it should help us just to be able to troubleshoot quicker what you need to do. We have them for all the devices and then also on here um, on the other side is just a card that's our contact card. Again, the pager number, um, we have an office but you don't want to go through that. Um, there are intervals in the daytime when we're on voicemail so you want to call the pager to make sure you can get somebody right away. Um, so, um, a, a little, uh, just to review, on the front of that card, it does, you know, uh, you know, for um, managing the urgent or the emergent situation, important to um, call us, let us help you from our end. But to the other point that I really want to make is that the patient and the caregiver are very well trained. I just did some time studies um, of the activity and post implant, we spend upwards to 20 hours with the patient and with their caregiver, training them on all aspects of daily care, and then even what to do in emergency situations. So if they're there and calm, please let them help you. Ask them to take a map for you. Ask them to tell you what the flow is. Ask them to tell you that the batteries are, um, are in good shape, that they don't need to be changed. Even the patient, if he's able to communicate with you. Um, let them help if they're, you know, uh, if it's a difficult situation and they are not calm and, um, you know, not contributing to the situation, then feel free to move them, remove them from the room, but ask them to get the VAD coordinator on the phone for you 
And when you're ready, we'll wait uh, so that we can uh, help out. Um, it is important that all that equipment stays affixed to them and that all their equipment is transported with them. Um, it isn't necessarily, I think, a, a policy within Sarasota County to take the patient back to Tampa General, but depending on the situation, I think that is something that we want to maybe negotiate. Is it the right thing to get them to the closest ER for emergency care and then transport them to TGH, or is, is it appropriate to bring them uh, initially? Um, as I said, just like any patient, we had a patient down here a couple of weeks ago that was bit by a rattlesnake. Um, we need him to get in and get somewhere for emergency care uh, into a local ER, and then he was transported to us. We would not want him admitted to a local hospital only because they don't have the equipment. They don't have those battery chargers or the, uh, the mobile power units that are used in the hospital or if the patient showed up and didn't have batteries, you know, that's why they need to come to us as well as the personnel that's trained to be able to take care of ads. So, you know, what's a little bit about the ABCs of, uh, of sort of taking care of these patients? Now, um, this algorithm was uh, created and endorsed by AHA, IHSLT, all of the sort of professional regulatory agencies that take care of ad patients. And, and what I wanna sort of demonstrate this to you is that um, in the first generation VADs, we used to sort of have a, a practice, a policy that for the bigger VADs, you could not do chest compressions. And there are people that still think that's to be the case. It is okay on these smaller continuous flow devices to do chest compressions if absolutely necessary. But in walking through this algorithm, you'll see what it's asking you to do is completely troubleshoot so that um, all attempts to restart the VAD have been exhausted. And if you can't restart the VAD, then you would need to move forward with chest compressions as an as a, um, option of last resort. So at the top, um, you see, um, you know, assisted ventilation if necessary and assess the perfusion. If they are, well, let me ask you, how do you assess for adequate perfusion? Skin color. Yeah. yeah. If they are, you know, just like I told you, they can still have all the same stuff any other patient uh, has. If not, if they are not adequately perfused, you wanna check the VAD and make sure that uh, the VAD is working. I don't know if you guys, maybe you guys in the front can notice while I've been running this HeartMate 2, can you hear it humming? So, and you can feel it, it's a bit of a buzz or a hum. If you listen over someone's chest wall that has a, a VAD, you will hear that sort of low pitched hum or buzz, or it sounds like something electronic, right? So if you hear that and it's working, you're like, okay, the device is working. Um, let me do everything I can to support that. And if it's not working, what we would do first is look at the batteries. Do the batteries need to be replaced? There are fuel gauges on the side of the batteries that show you if they're, uh, how much power they have left. I think there are five bars. If that's the case, then the, uh, the batteries can be replaced. If not, you can move forward with a controller exchange. Where is all that equipment located? In the bag. And if you don't have it? Well, if you don't have it, then what would you do? Try to restart it. Try to restart it. Well, okay. And then it doesn't restart. Then what would you do? Compressions. Compressions. 
impressions. That's, you know, so, you know, that's why I say um, in that kind of situation, let the family, let the patient help you. It is uh, important to follow ACLS guidelines. You can use the same medications just like you do per the guidelines. Many of our patients do have ICDs. If they do, let the device discharge as programmed. If they do not have a device, you can externally defibrillate and cardiovert just like you do for any other patient. Same um, chest wall placement. Just move everything out of the way and, and proceed with standard placement. Okay, put them on the Lucas. I'm sorry, what is that? The auto pulse, essentially. No. Okay. Um, only, it's still recommended not to use it only because it really hasn't been studied. What is, what is the app you recommend that we can put on devices? Um, I see several on here. It's ICAC, I-C-C-A-C. -C. That's the International VAD Coordinators Association. You have it? I think so. I can show it to you on my phone before I leave. Yeah, that'd be great. Can you tell us what, um, so if we get there and the patient has you know, some sort of complaint and we do a 12 lead EKG, can you tell us what to expect it, that to look like? Uh, regular rhythm. So, so yes, uh, so that's w what you would want and then you would treat um, standard. So um, their native heart still works, right? You want it to work as well as it can, contributing to the total flow, optimizing its function. So they should be in a regular sinus rhythm. If they're not, then you would treat it. So you would expect regular rhythm if it's uh, VT or VF, knowing because the device is doing the majority of the work, those patients will tolerate those dysrhythmias better than you and I would because they have a device, but they're not gonna tolerate it long-term. And there is also concern, even though these are anticoagulated, if, you, if the native heart is not working as, as in VFib, then certainly another opportunity for blood to pool or blood to stagnate. But you would still recommend treating it Yes, yes. Um, I uh, had a call a couple of years ago of a patient that was well known to the program, and um, he, we knew he had uh, malignant VFib, and there were plans for an ablation. He had gone home to take care of some things at home and was gonna come back, be admitted, and we were going to ablate him. At any rate, while home, he developed VFib again, and he knew it was VFib because he had had it many times before and knew what it felt like. So, um, as all patients, he was instructed to call 911 and then call us. So, I, I, uh, I heard him on the phone saying to the supervisor at the scene, you know, I have an LVAD, um, I have Tampa General on the phone, and I'm currently in VFib, I need to be transported up right away. And uh, the supervisor was like, hang on, there is nobody here in VFib. And then he's like, oh, I was like, you know, just tell him to wait in a few minutes, he'll wanna talk to me. So sure enough, in about five minutes, he got on the phone and I was like, you know, yes, he's in VFib, yes, he needs to be transported, he needs fluid and uh, just get, you know, just transport them up here. They're gonna take them to the lab this afternoon. The only reason we didn't defibrillate him is because of his history. Our electrophysiologist felt like if we did um, uh, defibrillate him, it may put him into asystole. And so that's why that decision was made. But that, you know, the reason that everything worked out and was successful for the patient is because we were all communicating. I have a question. Go ahead. Sure. So this may, may be silly, but so his native heart was in BFib, but the pump was doing enough to keep him in a life-sustaining? Correct. 
stay here. Okay. The pump is just a big dumb pump that is going to continue to flow four liters, um, irrespective of what the native heart is doing. Um, and that really illustrates it because he now, when he arrived, he was, uh, you know, obviously on a stretcher, about 30 degrees up. He was, he, he didn't feel great. He said he felt really weak um, and he was wanting something to eat and drink, which, you know, we obviously couldn't give him because he was going to the lab, but um, he didn't feel great, but, you know, he honestly looked good. He had a map of 60. You know, he just was trending down and he wasn't going to tolerate it uh, long term, but uh, he tolerated it, you know, a good 12 hours before he was um, ablated. Yeah. And how about a bad patients that present with ST elevation MI? I mean, I, I know they've already had PCI, but if they present that way, do they go to the cath lab? Yes. They do? Yes. I don't think anybody around here would take them, so that would be something. That would be yeah, and see, you know, again, that's uh, something that, you know, certainly Sarasota Memorial treats all the time and, and could do. It's just, I think the VAD um, uh, compounds everything and, you know, makes it, you know, just an extraordinary situation that they don't feel comfortable in handling. But the, the goal in that patient would be? To go to the cat for yes. Yes. It's very uncommon, but yes, we've we've done several. Yeah. I mean, could there be a moment you said that regardless of what the heart's doing, it's going to be pumping four liters a minute? Like, yes. Could you run on somebody realistically that went into asystole momentarily? And then I was just going to say we had a a young girl that was in asystole that we ran. We discharged her to home for Thanksgiving, um, and the end of the weekend she did pass away. But she was in asystole for about a week. Okay. Oh, and there were other things with her. Now she didn't feel great, but she had four liters of flow. Right. And that's certainly not desirable. But there were other circumstances. Um, with her, and we managed her. What other questions do you guys have? Tell, sure. Can you tell us about high flow alarms? So we talked about low flow. What do we? How do we manage high flow alarms? So under, um, you know, figure out what the underlying cause is. Like, are they fluid overloaded? You don't see it very often at all. Um, sometimes with, um, it, it more denotes, um, you know, uh, something wrong with the equipment because honestly, I don't think I've ever even seen one. I mean, this thing can't spin fast enough mm -hmm. to generate a high flow alarm. You know what I mean? It, it, it would probably, about the highest flow I've ever seen is 10 liters. And that person was on high dose um, pressors and ionotropes. We often use um, capnography as a huge metric of cardiac output. How does this device affect what we would see in waveform capnography? Maybe not waveform, but numerical. Um, everything I'm not necessarily thing? familiar with using that, but it should be. Uh, what you see in a, in a normal, uh, a, no, an unvatted patient. Um, I wouldn't expect it to be any different. Uh, I have some questions. Go. What is, what is the uh, life expectancy for somebody that has an LVAD? So with these devices, they can be used in a couple of different ways. They can be used as what we consider bridge to transplant. It means those patients that are eligible for a transplant, but they're too sick to continue to wait. A donor heart isn't something you can get from the shelf, a VAD is. 
So uh, about half of our patient population are bridged to transplant, uh, meaning they're waiting to recover, rehab, and then they will continue their wait for a donor heart. Um, the current allocation system for UNOS doesn't necessarily favor VADs at home like it used to. So for many of these patients are waiting a long time. Um, the device will last years. Our longest supported patient is 11 years. Longest supported patient in the country is like at 18 years now, same device. So for example, HeartMeet 2 uh, became commercially available, I believe it's 2006. So this is still pretty young in terms of, of um, uh, its age. We currently have a patient who has been on the device for 10 years and he's been on the transplant list for eight years. The second most common way that this device can be used is what we refer to as destination therapy, meaning patients are not a candidate for transplant for whatever reason, age, recent cancer diagnosis, um, other comorbidities. They could be implanted with the device and live on the device for the rest of their life. The other very, very, very small majority of our patients are bridged to recovery. So when a, a big sick heart is placed on a pump, the heart can actually rest. And uh, it was thought maybe some recovery or some rejuvenation of those uh, cardiac cells would occur. Recovery is rare in this patient population. It's just when you see it, you talk about it all the time. We did have a young uh, college age student a couple of years ago with COVID induced cardiomyopathy. And um, he was vatted for about 18 months. Heart showed evidence of recovery and he was explanted and he's back in college. So great story, beautiful story. We all cried, that's why I tell it all the time. The reality is it's rare. What is the quality of life with somebody that has LVAD? Like what are they not able to, you know, what, what, where's the limit? Where do they draw the line on? So we tell patients, huh? Uh, we tell patients, um, uh, you can do anything you want to do. You can't uh, submerge in water and you can't have an MRI. Everything else is up for negotiation. Um, no, I don't want you to skydive, but we've had them skydive. Um, we want you to travel. We want you to get on a cruise. We want you to get on a plane. We want you to fl travel internationally. Um, and, you know, after a time it becomes the VAD coordinator's job to be a bit of a concierge because we do spend a fair amount of time planning travel and trip ticking their trip so that they are connected with the closest VAD center. We want to make sure they have, you know, plenty of supplies, they understand what the, uh, the electrical outlet situation is all about. Um, we, we want them to live their life. We do uh, patient satisfaction surveys on um, a monthly basis. Um, we do quality of life surveys that are part of a registry where we um, you know, be able to go to cardiac rehab. But if they have problems with breathing because of COPD or that kind of thing, we're not gonna be able to cure that, right? Mm -hmm. So we also too, I mean, I wanna be, I want to be positive, but we also have to be realistic, particularly in having these discussions up front. Um, I should have, I didn't put them in just in the interest of time, but we do have an active support group. And uh, we just met, had a support group meeting on um, uh, last Friday. And the group is really, um, you know, uh, does very good. You'll see them though being very supportive of each other. A lot of them are hooked up socially because nobody kind of knows uh, what they're going through, but somebody else, uh, caregivers as well. So uh, this is the team at TGH. Um, we are specifically pointed to bad patients only. 
Um, we are available. There's nine coordinators mixed in there who share responsibility for the pager. Um, and then we have three assistants that work with the program. So we, we do want to hear from you, uh, especially if it's our patient, but if it's another patient and you just need help, please feel free to give us a call. We know, like I said, that there are a lot of visitors in your community um, right now that, that may or may not have our contact info. So I know that they are aware of a patient that's in their area. Um, is there a, do they make this list public or is there a HIPAA uh, related to it as far as if there is somebody in, in a response area or do they, are they encouraged to call their local department and say, hi, we're living in this, we just moved into your area, just to be, make you aware. How does that um, work? No, and I had sent it. Yeah, I have the list. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, or I, I can, I mean, I'm happy to resend it. I can pull it up in my... Yeah. What are the, what are the, what are the, uh, as far as HIPAA is concerned, as far as, you know, if we identify that it, uh, it in Station 9's area, there's an LVAP patient, are we, are we permitted to speak to the crews about this and just say, hey, be aware? Sure. Yes, that's... that's yes. Uh, when we did the support group meeting the other day, our, mm -hmm. our presentation was, was what to do for emergency I situations. And uh, we do a lot of EMS training, and so we did t tell the patients that, you know, that we have been, like we told them specifically, we were in Venice a couple weeks ago. So, and I, and I told the, the patient, I said, you can go there, you can, you know, tell them they know who you are, they know where you are, they, I mean, they feel safer because many of them realize they're the celebrity in their community. And it only, it only uh, makes them feel better, safer to know that you know they're there and you know a little bit about how to take care of them. So yes, patients uh, have given us permission to share their names and to share information with the community uh, in the interest of taking care of them. Yeah, I, think we have, I think we have four. Mm -hmm. But you sent me the information. Yes, actually, and you've got two new ones. Oh. So, and this is the season that they come. Um, one of my, my assistants, that's her job, like all of these calls we get, um, is um, we have a big notebook that we keep track of all of them, so we kind of know where they are, um, but you won't be surprised to know the phone calls we get. I have a patient in the ER, like I don't know anything about them, but you know we start at, you know, start at the beginning, and then can figure out where they're from and get clinicals. Did you guys have? Kind of referring to that uh, the list. Of, yeah, you know, and I think the list I did was Manatee and Sarasota. It was part of our district, even though we're Manatee County. A lot of our zip codes will show up as Sarasota County, so that's like one of the, some of the issues. We'll on the graph, I think it's got the ad, the mailing address including the zip code. Okay. So we a lot of people are like, oh, we're in Sarasota. I was like, no, you're in Manatee County. So nice try. And that's probably me too, because I don't necessarily know. <laughs> and um, what was the app that you recommended? I'm just seeing the one that says my all right. No, so my LVAD is, is just another site. That's how we trip tick the visits. It's got all of the bad centers. I believe there's nine in Florida right now. Um, but it's ICAC, which is I-C-C-A-C, -C -C, Field Service Guides. 